And what will happen when 10,000 boys and girls are already dead in the streets of Manila and blood will be, will be flowing in our very streets? I cannot, I said, resist the wailing of mothers who will now blame me that their children have died in the altar of freedom. But these young men were determined. They gave me only a few weeks to try to arrive at a solution with Mr. Marcos. And so, my friends, on August 4, much against my better judgment, I spoke in New York and I told Mr. Marcos, Believe me, Mr. President, that if you do not lift your martial law, bombs will be bursting in Manila. Mr. Marcos called me insane. You know what he said? He should not have had his heart operation. He should have had his head operated. He did not listen to me. But I felt it was my duty, and as I said, I promise I will not speak out against the Marcos regime. But national interest now dictates that I must warn Mr. Marcos for the last time. I will walk the last mile to prevent this carnage, but if Mr. Marcos will not listen, so be it. And as you very well know, bombs exploded in the city. August, September, and October, and Mr. Marcos made me the mad bomber. I did not threaten him. I had nothing to do with the bombing. I only told Mr. Marcos and I warned him that the patience of the Filipino people have run out. And that if he does not yield now, then he shall reap the whirlwind. It is in that context that on December 16, Mrs. Marcos called me in the Waldorf Sweet Towers. We spoke for four and a half hours. I told Mrs. Marcos I have no more political ambition, Mrs. Marcos. I told her that I am through with politics. I told her that I am now a broken man, I said, and maybe this is the last time I'll see you. And she said, why? The last time I saw you, I had a broken heart. You call me now, I have a broken leg. Next time you'll see me, I'll have a broken neck. <laughs> but I went to see Mrs. Marcos precisely to try to tell her of the imminence and the gravity of the situation. Mrs. Marcos said, are you willing to agree to a moratorium? Well, I said, Mrs. Marcos, who am I to agree to a moratorium? I'm not the mad bomber. And then she said, well, whatever it is, whether you're the mastermind or not, every time you speak in New York, bombs burst in Manila. So why don't you now appeal? I said, yes, Mrs. Marcos, I will appeal. I will appeal to the opposition in the Philippines, but for what? And for how long? Give us six months, she said. I said, maybe 90 days is more reasonable. I do not know, I said, whether they will follow me. But I will make my appeal to whoever is bombing in the Philippines to give you the chance. But what will you do? I promise you, she said, if you give us a moratorium, President Marcos will leave martial law. I said, you mean that? She said, yes. And as you very well know, a month after I met her, martial law was lifted. But what kind of lifting? And I told Mrs. Marcos. Mrs. Marcos, I said, if your husband is sincere, nothing is impossible. But if your husband is not sincere, nothing is possible. And believe me, I said, if you are not sincere, then the question is, how many will die? My friends, it is now February 15, and there is one month to go. I am not threatening Mr. Marcos. I am only reiterating my word of advice. If they do not increase the freedoms in our country, then I'm afraid, I'm afraid that bombs will burst again. On February 1, last Saturday, I received a most poignant letter from a mother and a wife, and I'd like to read it to you. My dear Senator Aquino, Thank you very much for remembering my husband in your negotiations with the government. I have written you a longer letter which will probably reach you in a few days. I am writing you now because I have just received word from my husband that he intends to go on a hunger strike starting Wednesday, February 4, starting with breakfast. The purpose of this is to protest his not being permitted to talk to his lawyers and his immediate relatives, me and my only son. I think he chose February 4 as the date of his hunger strike because he was caught on December 4, and by February 4, he would have been two months incommunicado. I understand that a number of other detainees accused of their involvement with the April 6 movement will also go on a sympathy strike, hunger strike, beginning February 4.
Please pray for them. Thank you in advance for any help you can give me. Sincerely, Tina Montiel. Mr. Montiel was arrested on December 4. He has been kept in comunicado in the provincial command headquarters in Laguna. No lawyers have been allowed to see him. His wife and four-year-old son went there, pleaded with the colonel, but they refused to allow, to allow him to see them. She went to the Dep deputy defense minister Barbero, and minister Barbero gave a letter instructing the commander to allow the wife to see this man. Again, they did not allow him. The suspicion is they've tortured him beyond recognition. That's why they cannot produce him, because there might be evidence. Today, the New York Times carried a long story on the saga of Rolando Montiel, that in spite of the lifting of martial law, there are still people held in comunicado in our land who are actually refused the very basic humanitarian consideration of seeing their lawyers and their family. What is so bad about seeing your wife and your children? I know exactly what Montiel is passing because I also suffered more than a month, two months sometimes, without seeing my wife and my children and the mental torture is terrific. This man is supposed to be presumed innocent until proven guilty and therefore is entitled to the very rudiments of basic law. But no, under our martial law regime, he's still being held in comunicado. How many Montiels are there? How many unsung, unnamed Filipinos are still languishing in the jails of our land? In that blighted land of ours where our founding fathers gave up their lives that we may see the morning sun. How many, my friends? And so while we are here in Los Angeles, in savoring the meaning, the true meaning of freedom, laughing, enjoying, dancing our Valentine's Day, there are still many Filipinos pining away merely to have a chance, one glimpse of their wife and their children. I sent a cable to Mr. Marcos. The military went to one of the hunger strikers. They said, Montiel will already see his family. They stopped the strike. Six days later, they found out they were fooled, and so they resumed their strike. Some of them are already on the tenth day of the strike. I know what it is to go on hunger strike. On the tenth day, my friend, your stomach, your stomach will actually be only a handful. I know what it means. The hunger pains that you go on the first, second, third, fourth, and fifth day. I know the crumbs in the stomach. I know when your hands start trembling and you feel cold because the fat in your body is wasting away. Many of our countrymen are in that predicament. I only hope and pray that Mr. Marcos will now heed to the last cable I sent this morning together with Senator Stanyada and Manglapos, asking him in the name of God and humanity to stop the hunger strike by merely allowing Montiel to see his wife and children. I am not saying Montiel is innocent or guilty. All we are asking is that he be allowed to see his wife and his child and his lawyer. That's not asking too much. And yet, my friends, today, as we have this freedom rally, there are Filipinos deprived of those basic freedoms. I would like to reiterate, therefore, my stand. After almost seven years and seven months in prison, I have lost my appetite in office. I do not have any more the answers to the many solutions to our country. That's why I went to Harvard precisely to try to craft the many answers, the malay of our, of our society. I know for a fact we cannot go back to the old society where a few enjoy the fat of the land and the many suffer. But today, in spite of martial law, the rich are getting richer and the poor are growing in numbers. That cannot be. The meaning of our struggle is to be able to return the freedom. First, you must return the freedom so that all segments of our community, whether from the left or from the right, will have the right to speak. And then in that open debate, in that clash of debate in the marketplace, we will produce the clash between the thesis and the antithesis, and we will have the synthesis for the Filipino people. I do not hold the key to our liberation. I do not know all the solutions to our many problems. All I know is that if the situation continues in the Philippines, then blood will flow. And when blood flows, there will be no victor and there will be no vanquished because all of us will be the victim of our folly. I am therefore appealing to Mr. Marcos. Mr. Marcos, hear the cry of your people. You have been in office for 16 years. We do not want your blood. We do not want revenge. We do not want to hurt your family. We only ask that freedom be returned. We ask for nothing more, but we will accept for nothing less. We tell Mr. Marcos, you may have your exercise, 
I have said time and again I'm no longer interested in politics. But if this will speed up the normalization of my country, if I must go back there again and sacrifice myself in a political arena in spite of the fact that I have no money anymore to spend, if that will restore freedom, then I shall go back. And I tell you now.